Anyway, this is really about and kind of fitting for that uh, experience when something feels like it just doesn't quite work. Like it's a little bit broken, like there's a flaw, a hole, a frustration. And um, we know this both as users and as people that are creating experiences. And I couldn't think of anyone better to help me illustrate this point than the very wise Snoop Dogg. <laughs> A message to Xbox One or Microsoft or whoever the fuck. Y'all fucking server is fucking whack, man. Y'all gonna make me switch to PlayStation if y'all don't help me get this shit fixed. It's that difficult to play somebody online. What the fuck is you doing, Bill Gates? Fix your shit, man. It's so great. And I mean, poor, poor Bill Gates. I mean, guys out there with the Gates Foundation trying to, you know, make the world a better place. And Snoop is just blasting him on Instagram because he can't play Xbox with his friends. And I think we've all been there, right? And, and uh, in, in some way or another. Uh, and in three hours, 27,000 people have commented on this and liked it and shared it and everything else. And, you know, he's pissed. And, um, and who should he be mad at? Should he be mad at EA? Should he be mad at Bill Gates? Probably not. Um, what about Microsoft? Maybe it's uh, his own internet service provider. And again, we can relate to this as both creators of experiences and also as users of experience. And there's a lot going on here. There's lots of little details. There's lots of things that can go wrong. And it's important to understand all these, these pieces of the puzzle. And I'm sure you've been in a meeting when someone's told you to uh, not overthink it. They say, don't overthink it. And I'm a big believer of overthinking it. And um, so for the last four years, I've run a team of about 15, and we've created systems that enable people to um, manage websites. So our customers are people that are designers and developers of websites. So if they are in one of our systems managing a website and doing administrative work, they're not doing what they want to be doing. Um, they're basically doing busy work and cleanup and things like that. So we want to get them into our control panel and out as fast as possible. So we've had a mantra on our team which has been, let's do more so our users can do less. And a lot of this, the doing more, is not just more code and more UI, but it's really understanding the empathetic side of where they're coming from and understanding how they work and all the little micro steps along the way. And, um, you know, having that understanding is really key, and not just for work that our team does, but internally uh, throughout the company. If everyone is on board, we all become advocates for the user. And when someone says don't sweat the small stuff, I think it's really important to sweat the small stuff because what may, not, what may be small to someone in product may be huge for those of us that are in user experience. And as designers, we are providing a problem-solving service. And the key word here for me is service, because I do believe design really is a service. It's a service industry. And you may have all read this article, have seen this quote. This was, uh, was in TechCrunch uh, last year, and it says, Uber, the world's largest taxi company, owns no vehicles. Facebook, the world's most popular media owner, creates no content. Alibaba, the most valuable retailer, has no inventory. And Airbnb, the world's largest accommodation provider, owns no real estate. Something interesting is happening. And something interesting is happening. And yes, this is about a social economy, and it's about you know, virtuality and what else, but it's also about service. And currently, services make up 84% of the United States economy, which is an enormous, enormous number. And the things we use in our purchase, uh, and purchase can be broken down into tangible and intangible products. Um, so what do I mean by that? Um, you know, a service is really an intangible product, whereas a pair of shoes or something like this would be tangible. And in the world of intangible products, and we talk about service, when you ask people about service and service industry, often they talk a lot about things that are like plumbers. And as designers, that may be a hard realization to make that we are also providing this kind of service, right? Um, but we are creating intangible product. And when we do it right, we're creating meaningful connections and interactions between people. And we also exist in a time and a place um, in an industry where the lines are very, very blurred here. Um, the iPhone, for example, this is a tangible good. It's a product that we stand in line like crazy people overnight to get our hands on this thing, but it is also very much service driven. Um, and good experience should be a priority, but often it's not. Um, it's hard to quantify experience. 
and often it's a question of priorities and opinion. And however, the effects of good experience on your business is huge. It's good for you, it's good for your business, it's good for your team, it's good for morale. And we in the experience and design world are really kind of up against it. Um, organizations tend to spend 20 times as much on marketing as they do on experience. And I understand that marketing is important. I worked as a creative director in the agency world for more than a decade selling cars and beer and furniture and everything else. Um, but 20 to 1 is rough. And companies operate on priorities. And priorities at many companies center on the bottom line. So we're constantly trying to raise our hand and get our voices heard because they're investing in design and they're investing in experience. But we're there to do a lot more than just make things pretty. And there was recently a, uh, a study done at the Harvard Business School, and they found that customers who have had a good experience spend 140% more than those who have had poor experiences. Um, but it's sometimes hard to get other people on board to see that they need to invest and spend time in experience. So today I want to talk about three main things. One is design for service. Two, what makes a great service? What are the elements of a great service? And three, how do we sell this internally? Um, and I think it's important to remember that your best designs may not be your, your most beautiful. And there's an example that I have that I use at a lot of talks and I use when I go into schools. We talk about basic design and basic problem solving through design. And this is an example of empathetic problem solving that has sustained years of tech innovations. And it starts here in my kitchen. And so every morning when I wake up early, my, uh, my kids wake me up, I'm confronted with these two machines, and they kind of look more like this a little bit, right? But still, pretty easy to distinguish. We have a toaster on one side, and we have a coffee maker, and the coffee maker is about 10 years old, so it seems pretty simple, right? So then I go to plug one in, and this is what I'm confronted with. And it, again, it sort of looks like this. And um, so the thing is, if I, I, I plug one in, and then I wait about 20 seconds for the light to finally go on on the coffee maker. So it's like a Russian roulette of getting ready in the morning. And I understand in the world of problems that we encounter, this is like the dumbest, most inconsequential pr problem. But you don't want to deal with me, nor do my kids, if I have not had coffee. So why don't I leave them plugged in? Well, there's ghost power and all that other stuff. But I'm not the only user. And you can't only design for yourself. And this is the situation going on in my outlets. And my wife stays up way later than me. She leaves her her iPhone or iPad plugged in, and I do not want to disrupt her workflow because what seems better for me um, could be worse for someone else. So I came up with a really simple solution, and this is the solution. I put a little piece, uh, like a red sticker on this, and this was amazing, the greatest solution ever. For two weeks, you know, I'd come in, like blindfold, I'd put that thing in, it was great, and then I got some user feedback. And the user feedback said, I can never remember if the sticker's for the coffee or the toaster. It drives me crazy. <laughs> And that's from the most important user I deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. My wife, Mindy, mother of two, definitely not a morning person. Um, so like any good designer, I iterated and improved. And here is the solution I came up with. And this is it. <laughs> so this has lasted for a really long time. And I mean, is this a great design? No. Is it good problem solving? Yes. I mean, so hopefully no one's going to pin this on Pinterest or something like that, right? Under ideas. Um, but. Um, <laughs> You know, this is a design that has withstood numerous uh, iterations in the world of tech, I would imagine. So, um, you know, when we talk about design and we talk about trends, you know, I, I do a lot of brand workshops and I go into a lot of uh, startups and things like that and work with them on brands. And one of, the, one of the, th the things that we do is we take a brand that would never have a retail store and we ask them to imagine what their retail store would be like. And if you think about the places you work, what would your retail store be like? What would the signage be like? Where, where would someone check out, right? What color would be painted? And 90% of the time, everyone says, oh, okay. They, they start designing a store, and it becomes this, which is great, because this is, you know, I think, beautiful. You, a lot of you, especially the ones on your Macs right now, probably think it's really beautiful. And, but no one ever says this. And there's a reason why. But you can go to any McDonald's anywhere in the world, and you know what to expect. You know how it works. You know how to order. You know, you know where to sit. But there's the little things that make the difference, right? The intangible parts, like the actual aesthetics of the place and, and, and that maybe the food isn't that great for us. And it's those kind of things that really differentiate and help with customer experience. So when we talk about service and we talk about the trademarks of a good service, I believe good services should be usable, efficient, and desirable. And um, I want to dive into 
crafting these experience and tie this to some of the case studies I've worked on and, and hopefully there's some good crossover there for you. So one is talking about consistency and experience. Secondly, value for effort. And finally, understanding emotional circumstance. So let's start um, with consistency and experience because as designers, we're all designing now for very complex systems. That's okay because we're good at that. We're used to it. We're, using, we're used to having to change what we're doing, right? And you know, when do we start thinking about service? And when do we start thinking about when a user interacts with our design or product? And, you know, if you think about this conference, the, you could say that the unsung hero of this conference is the power company. No one here has thought about the power company at all, um, except maybe the organizers. But, um, you know, if the power was out, this would be a major disaster, and we'd all be talking about the power company. So we tend to only think about service a lot of times when it's negative, and we can think about our pal Snoop here, who probably doesn't spend a lot of time thinking about the Xbox server. Um, so when service is poor, uh, we try and think of ways to make it better. And a place where service is very poor is at the airport. And I'm sure if any of you have traveled domestically here in America, um, you've experienced this. And um, you know it sucks. And when we're standing in line, I think a lot of us instinctively start breaking down the service, right? How could we do it better? Why don't they do this? Why don't they open this one up? How come that guy's getting to go first? And you know, are the airlines thinking about it? Do the airlines give a shit um, that they're standing in these lines? If I was working at an airline, if I was working on a plane, I'd be really upset that someone that's about to sit down on my little plane for the next five hours is just in a really pissed off mood. And so where does the travel experience begin and end? And if you think about this, you know, you know the airlines that think the travel experience begins when you get on their plane, and you know the ones that think about it here. What is that website like? Is it easy to use? What is that experience like? And now as things get better and better, we have a mobile boarding pass. So this makes it a little easier when we get to the airport. And then when we get there, what is that experience like at the check-in desk? Are they charging us $50 for a bag? If you're traveling with children, are they charging $50 to check a car seat that you have to, by law, bring? Um, and you know, all these things are little pieces along the way that make us decide which airline we're going to fly. Are there things that we can do to get us through security a little bit faster? And when we get to the gate, what is that like? Is there one outlet and it's like Lord of the Fly style that everyone's trying to plug their iPhone in? Or do they have out outlets all over the place? Is there coffee? Are there amenities? Then we get on the plane. We have that experience. We get off. How do we collect our baggage, right? Does the airline care about that? Do they care about the oversized baggage? Lots of little, little pieces along the way, right? That all become maybe part of this product or definitely part of the travel experience. And do we trust the airlines enough? Do we believe in that brand enough that when we buy that airline ticket and they tell us that we can rent a car from Hertz, do we trust them? Do we do that? Have they built that relationship with us? And same goes for a hotel. And then we finally get to what a lot of people would say are the product of travel, which is not selfie sticks, but, but memories, right? Because that's what travel is really about. It's about memories, and the memories circle back to where we started. So we spend a lot of time where I've been working thinking about our user experience outside of the user experience, if that makes sense. So where in your user experience, you start th thinking about your user's experience. What are their offices like? What are devices are they on? Do we care where they are? And I think all that stuff is really, really important. And, and we'll talk a little bit more about how to, how to dive into these other, other aspects of what the user experience is about. Because all of this can really impact the way someone is using a UI that you are creating. Um, Secondly, I want to talk about value for effort because everything we do requires effort. And you know that feeling when trying to buy something online is just a little bit too irritating and you just need to just walk away from it. You're just done. And the truth is we'll do a lot for a reward. I just filled out a survey that took me like 15 minutes to get 20 bucks off. It hurts next time. Um, but maybe it was worth it. I'm not sure. So. Um, I want to talk to you about the Summer Movie Spectacular. And several years ago, when I was still in the agency world, and I was feeling increasingly burned out on building websites and, and campaign sites for, for brands, um, we pitched this idea to Yahoo. And this was uh, at the time where every brand wanted to have millions of people like them on Facebook. They felt like that was going to really do it for them. Um, and, and maybe it did. I don't know. I hear things aren't so great at Yahoo right now. Um, but anyway, we pitched this idea to Yahoo Movies, um, which at the time was the most trafficked movie site on the internet, according to Yahoo. Um, and 
but they did show us some data that probably means I was right. Regardless, one of, one of, one of the biggest movie sites. And we came up with this immersive multi-step campaign to boost the following on Facebook and increase traffic and people review, reviewing movies um, on Yahoo Movies. And uh, this was my first real exposure to a digital physical project that included discovery, adoption, and social promotion. And this is what it was. Yahoo Movies and Regal Entertainment Group celebrate sizzling summer movie season with mega popcorn giveaway. And what that basically means is if you like Yahoo Movies and check in, uh, you get a free popcorn at Regal. And we talked to a bunch of moviegoers, and the thing that they liked the most about going to the movies was that a small popcorn cost $6. And so we partnered Yahoo and Regal together, and there's 6,000 Regal cinemas. And basically, any Regal cinema you went to, you took out your phone, you liked Yahoo and checked in, we gave you a digital coupon right there to walk up to the counter, scan it, and you get a free popcorn. People were stoked on it, right? Because six bucks you know, for a popcorn is a lot. And this had all the hallmarks of a great campaign. It was socially relevant. Um, you know, it was all about summer movies. Uh, we connected people online and offline. Uh, there was a relevant reward, the popcorn that everyone wanted that was a major pain point for them, and the ability to share and engage. You know, you're on Facebook and then going back to Yahoo Movies, and they rate the movies A, B, C, D, F, so it drove a ton of traffic. And when we looked at all the pieces here, this is a massive, multi-step disaster of touch points. We had everything from, and I'll explain, we had everything from posters and signage in the theaters, we had widgets that went in people's blogs, we have videos, um, that were on YouTube. We had pre-roll video. We even had this thing up here was uh, in the Tennessee region, uh, Regal sends out a, uh, a coupon mailer. So we had to do a printed coupon to send out. And all of this hinged on this scrappy little, and this is really dating when this came out by looking at this design, um, mobile website. And honestly, we were a little bit worried about the mobile website. Um, but there were no real pitfalls with that. It actually worked really, really well. And the way that we sort of mapped this out, the way that it was going to work is that people were going to hear about this. And this was a time when mom blogs were really huge and they were driving a lot of traffic. And someone would hear about it, they'd go to the movies, they'd see an ad, you know, some of the signage, or they'd see pre-roll, they'd check in, they get their coupon, they get their popcorn, they watch the movie, we say, hey, how was the movie? They rate it and they go back and the circle repeats. And it was going pretty well for the first couple weeks. And then we realized there was a bit of a problem in the user experience before they actually even got to the user experience. And that started right here. People were hearing about this like on a Tuesday. And when they went to the movie on Saturday, they had kind of forgot about it because, you know, it's like if you go to the movie on the weekend, it's a little bit hectic, maybe you're forgetting. They'd sit down, they'd see the pre-roll ad holding their popcorn that they paid for. And they'd say, God damn it, I forgot to use that coupon. They'd check in, get their coupon, go back to the front, to the cashier and they joined the line of people that were trying to get free popcorn and it wasn't happening. So this was kind of a big problem. And sort of like the coffee maker, we, we solved this with a very uh, uh, unelegant solution, which was basically this. Um, it was a little widget that we made for Facebook, um, for uh, people's blogs, where anytime it was promoted, you could put in your phone number and it would text you a link. And just that behavior of someone getting a link sent, sent to them made them remember that they needed to do this. We never had this problem again, and it actually improved the flow that we had. It went from finding out about it, getting the text message, going to the movies, you know, checking in, getting the popcorn, watching the movie, blah, 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 blah. And, and it, worked, it worked fantastically well. This little nasty change that we made that had nothing to do about our mobile website that we were so worried about the APIs and everything like that. It just had to do with the discovery portion of this. And this was an incredibly successful campaign. It was the most successful social campaign Yahoo had ever run. It was the biggest and kind of weirdest campaign that Facebook had ever tried. Um, we added 1.2 million likes in the summer. They added 1.4 million minutes to Yahoo Movies, and we gave away a million bags of popcorn, whether that's good or bad. Um, you know, it's up to you to decide. Um, but really understanding all the little steps in the way it helped that, and the changes we made really had nothing to do about this little kind of crappy mobile site that we had built. Um, do you guys have Uber Eats here, for those of you in here? Has anyone used Uber Eats yet? No? Okay, so this is happening in LA, and it's kind of amazing. Um, so I work in an area of LA called Culver City. There's uh, tons of agencies and studios, and there's nowhere to eat around. And if you may not know this, but traffic in Los Angeles is really kind of bad. 
um, so no one wants to drive at lunch. So, um, and a lot of us, like myself, are too lazy to make lunch. So Uber has this thing, you go onto their app, and instead of clicking on a car, you click on a knife and fork. And they partner with three different restaurants every day, and they have one dish from each restaurant. And you just tap it, and you, the one that you want, and you pay with your finger, and it's delivered to you in 10 minutes. And it's kind of amazing, and it solves a major problem of being able to get something decent to eat pretty fast. And it's relatively affordable, uh, but not super cheap. But you know, it's, it's decent quality. Um, but if you think about the elements of this service, right, let me break it down for you. There's a random person driving a car full of takeout food, and they're just driving around, okay? The food has likely been sitting for a while, and who really knows when this was made? But my expectations are not that low because I've used Uber a lot, it works really well, and so I'm gonna try it. And plus, they have stuff like this that looks really good. This is a quinoa power salad um, that is apparently really good for me. And so um, I, I basically uh, gave everyone on my team, I said, let's just try this thing out for a week and let's see, see what it's like, let's see what we like. And um, so here's the thing, right? So this is what comes. And <laughs> it really doesn't look that great. Um, and, it, and it was okay. It's like kind of like being on an airplane, but you're at your desk. Um, and so I was like, all right, but here's the good thing, right? The, the value for effort, the effort is I'm in a meeting and I'm like this and it shows up. So that's kind of great. All right, so then we tried this one, and here's your Chinese chicken salad, and that's what comes. So also, a little bit of a letdown, this dog down here who sits under my desk every day and tries to eat my lunch was into it. Um, so, uh, but, um, so then, the next day, they had this sandwich called the Godmother, okay? Now the Godmother is this sandwich that's like famous in Los Angeles as being like the best sandwich in LA. If you go to the place that sells it, it's like a 40 minute line to get this sandwich. So they had the Godmother, so we ordered like 12. And it came, and it was awesome. So we figured out that ordering sandwiches from there is really good. The sandwich thing they've got down, salad thing, not so much. But the service is consistently usable and efficient, so we keep using it. And this is an incredibly competitive market uh, right now. In just a couple of minutes off the top of my head, I put together all these logos of all the places that deliver. And a lot of these places are actually having an incredibly negative impact on restaurants. Because if I have a small restaurant with two or three people working there, I'm not ready for delivery. My friend opened a burger place in LA, they don't have a phone number because they don't want people to call in and order. And so once these guys start doing it and they add your, like the seamlesses and the chow nows, add your name to their list, you could get 60 extra orders at lunch. And you know that whole touch point uh, for a restaurant of their food is, is critical. So if I get something that's taken me 58 minutes, that's crazy, right? And these are the wait times at a place like DoorDash. So although the Uber stuff is a little bit hit and miss, the main uh, value that I get for the effort is really, really, really solid. Um, you know, food that I can order in a meeting with my finger, comes in 10 minutes, is worth it for me. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about is understanding emotional circumstance. And, uh, you know, everything we've looked at and everything we do makes us feel something, you know, sometimes it's frustration, sometimes it's contentedness, sometimes it's something more subtle. And I think it's, um, you know, actually it's interesting because this quote went up earlier and this is one of my favorite quotes. Um, the main tenet of design thinking is empathy for the people you're trying to design for. And as designers, we really wear a lot of hats and we really have to be facilitators and we have to start bringing more people into the work that we do. Um, you know, advocating for your users should be something that everyone in your organization does. And I know you're sitting there right now and you can think of the people that in your organizations that probably do not advocate for the users. And that makes things really, really difficult. And I like to have the uncomfortable conversation and ask them to kind of talk about feelings at work. And when someone comes up with an idea that you know is just kind of just like a bad thing to do for a user, you really have to ask them. And it's as simple as saying, hey, you're a customer of AT&T or whatever. Like, what if AT&T tried to do that to you? Like, how would that make you feel? And it sounds like a silly thing to do, but it's really important because they know it sucks. And when they know it sucks, they start dialing it back a little bit. And um, I want to talk about this uh, WordPress uh, hosting product that we worked on for a while at at Media Temple when I was there, and um, this was one of the more challenging projects that we worked on over the years there, and there are more than 70 million websites that use WordPress. Does anyone use WordPress in here? Okay, so that's about 75% of the room. Um, and that accounts for about 20% of all websites 
on the internet. Um, and there are no shortage of companies that host WordPress, and it's all very, very similar. It's very commoditized. Um, it's very hard to differentiate. Um, so the little things do kind of make a big difference. And so when we started, we had put together all these personas of the kind of people that use this work, and we talked to them a lot. And we, we, we asked them what works, what doesn't work. And they had a lot of issues that we couldn't control. There were things that were just happening in the WP admin that were things that were completely out of our hands. But one of the things we could, we could control was the onboarding. And we kept hearing that there were problems with people actually just setting up WordPress accounts at a variety of different hosts. Um, it was really, really cumbersome. And they kept saying things like, um, we don't know when the site's gonna be ready. And um, so we had this very sort of high level stepped out process of the things that they do when people need to set up a WordPress site, right? And this is all about the, what they're doing. They put in their user information, they choose whether they want a theme, and then they go through the site provisioning, which is basically the server actually creating it. And we added this step to a lot of the stuff we're doing, which is the how are they feeling. And we use simple icons to show, right, across the board. You know, we don't need a spreadsheet, we don't need a report. Overall, this is how people are feeling when they're putting in user information. It's good, they feel great, we understand it, right? The theme selection is easy. The site provisioning is a nightmare for them. And it was that thing where they kept saying, I kept wondering when the site was going to be ready. Because sometimes it takes three minutes, sometimes it takes five minutes, sometimes it takes 30 seconds, and this is all across the board, right? Um, and there are benchmarks, like some places will say your site will be ready in 25 seconds. And so most of our meetings used to start with UX and UI. And slowly, we started bringing, over the past few years, um, bringing in people from other departments into the kind of work that would really be only the work that we're doing, right? So we bring in people from product, customer support, engineering, and even someone who's a WordPress evangelist, an expert on WordPress. And we really needed to get everyone in the room because we needed to make what seemed like a pretty obvious change. So we were running a cron job. Every five minutes, the server would look to see if there are any sites waiting to be provisioned. And that, if they were, then they would fail the WordPress instances. So you could wait for a really long time. And we wanted to get this down to 30 seconds. And our engineering team, because of the headache that it would create for them, said the best they could probably do is two minutes. So I said, I had to make a compelling, empathetic argument. So I stood up in the room and I said, them this. <laughs> so I just counted to 10, but I stood there for 30 seconds. And they're like, what the fuck is going on with this guy? <laughs> you know? I, like they thought I was having a stroke or something, right? <laughs> and, and it was like, uh, I, it wasn't really something I had planned, but I was trying to figure out what's 30 seconds long. Commercials, we skip commercials all the time. 30 seconds is a long time. So when I'm standing up for 30 seconds and they're really uncomfortable, I'm like, okay, so our provisioning time right now is four times that. So it doesn't matter, I can have a little video, I can have a little bar, we need to get this time down. So they managed to get it down to 35 seconds, which was really, really good. But then, you know, when you put that work out there and you get people thinking like that, you get people to come up with great ideas. And there's a brilliant guy who was on my team there named Ara Abkarians, his Twitter's It's Me Ara. And he was like, hey, what if uh, I made this cool thing for someone to do while we were provisioning? And so this is a, gonna be a sped up version of what the WordPress onboarding looks like. So you could either create a site, you could import a site, or you could migrate from somewhere else on the platform. So the first thing you do, it's pretty easy, you fill it out, and it panels left and right, because it's made that you can do it on iPad pretty easy. And then when they finish, it says, congratulations, while we set up your site, won't you help us save the galaxy? And he made this awesome game. This game has a, uh, a high scoreboard, um, and it takes usually around 30 seconds, and people played it, and the interaction was really high. And what we found on a lot of products is when people purchased the hosting service, they would purchase it, they'd go back, and we'd have to send them reminder emails. If you ever bought hosting anywhere, Squarespace, they'd say, hey, how's that Squarespace site going? You know, you set it up, and it's been three days. You haven't really done anything, right? And so this, we found that over 90% of people went right into their site and activated it because the engagement was really high. And they had just spent a bunch of money with us and we continued that nice experience throughout the actual provisioning and setup of the site. So this was all about a really big project that we worked on for about a year. It was very cross-departmental and it brought a lot of new thinking into the way that we work. And so I wanna talk about how this also works for when you're rolling out a new feature. And um, so recently, 
a lot of you may that live here in the States may have got a new debit or credit card with a little chip in it. And um, they've had this overseas forever, and we just got them. And a lot of the banks have been really excited about this. Um, I've been a Citibank customer for 15 years. Um, I love their apps. I love all their stuff. They're, as far as banks goes, they rule for me. Um, the way that they sort of were rolling this out was really interesting. They, taught their, they did all these videos, and they, they, they talked mainly about how you can use this overseas. And now when you go to that restaurant in Paris, you can plug your card in, and it's going to be no problem. And everyone's super happy. Um, and, but back at home, people are freaked out. Okay, so this was around, I think this was around November, right? Will those new smart chip equipped ATM cards be easier to lose? People are worried in the market. Here's, a, here's an interview um, with a guy who has a payment processor. If EMV, the chip card, does slow down the transaction process, if people do leave cards in the machine, you have a scenario where mobile does become a value add if that transaction is quicker. People are worried that people are gonna stop wanting to go to stores because now they have to change what they're doing. At some grocery stores, this is the one I go to, they actually put a piece of tape over the chip thing. They don't want to deal. They're tired of having this conversation. Okay? And this is, if you think about it, well, let me show you this next quote because this is a really good one. One Walmart executive said he expects widespread checkout problems and anarchy during the holiday season because of confusion over how to use the cards, which must be dipped into the machine and left there for f several seconds as opposed to a momentary swipe. We're using words like anarchy here because we have to do this instead of this. People hate change. People hate workflows being disrupted, right? So this has turned into kind of a disaster in the grocery stores for anyone with these chip cards. Uh, the line in Trader Joe's is like three times as long now. And it's because, do I put this in now? Or, because you used to be able to swipe right away, but now you have to, you know, and so, you know, but if you go to Paris, it's awesome. Okay, so <laughs> this, is what, this is what happened at my ATM and many of the ones that I've used. Um, which I thought was really interesting. It says, please dip your card and remove it to get started. So, sorry for this sort of crappy video. So I dip it in. I'm sorry, I can't read your card. Can you dip it in again and remove it smoothly? So here I go, and I dip it in and remove it smoothly. And 30 seconds later, it kicked me out. And there's a guy standing there, and he goes, you have a chip card? And I said, yeah. And um, it's always great when someone's talking to you at the ATM and they're like super close. And <laughs> And he's like, no, no, here's what you gonna do. It kicked you out, okay, put it back in. It's gonna kick it out again, then put it in the next time, and it's gonna tell you to hold it in there. And I was like, that is a crazy workaround, but thanks for letting me know that. So sure enough, it's kicked me out again. And now, for some reason, on like the seventh try, it says at the top, you can't really, please reinsert your chip card and leave it in there. And so I do, and it works. I don't know why. Um, you know, we figured it out. But people don't want to always figure it out. And it's our job to kind of figure that out. So if you think about like the overall uh, incentive here of having this chip card, it's supposed to be something great. The conversation should be around, man, these banks are doing awesome stuff for our security. But instead, go look up chip card like on Twitter. And it's just people being like, my chip card doesn't work here, there, there. It's, this is kind of a big problem. And it makes me think like, are people at the banks not using their ATMs? Because this seems to be something that's kind of universal. And a bad experience kills trust. Every time I go to the store now, I'm wondering if it's gonna work. I'm not sitting there like holding my steering wheel freaked out, but I just know when I get up there, do I put this in, do I do this, do I, you know? And it's these little things that make it like not a great experience being a customer. And it's a bad thing when I'm not trusting my bank. Um, you know, and a lot of the banks had the ability to really look like they were leaders and innovators, but now they kind of look like they just don't have their shit together. So um, the marketing was good. But marketing is not really part of good user experience. Marketing you know, supports the brand, and user experience supports the users. And it makes me think of something I always ask when I do workshops is how many of your bosses actually use your service? Because it makes me think that there's a lot of people at the banks, at Citi, at Bank of America that probably use their ATMs. And maybe there isn't a squeaky wheel like me that's going to complain about it in a meeting and try and hold it. And a good experience is holistic, and a good experience is always evolving. And in the six weeks since I took that video, now when you first put it in and take the card out, it puts the yellow text on the screen that tells you to put your chip card in. And there's obviously some kind of technical struggle there that they can't do it on the front of the screen, but you know it does improve. And even everyone's favorite example of 
great design, great problem solving, has issues too. And this is a video from um, when the iPhone 4S came out and with Siri, and everyone was really pumped. And everyone knows about the idea of FOMO, fear of missing out, and there's nothing worse than feeling left out. So, you know, Siri's great if you sound like me and you have an American accent back then. My mom's from Zimbabwe. She has, uh, does not have an American accent. Um, she could never use Siri. And here's what happened in Scotland. It created quite some excitement among techno geeks when it was launched in London less than two weeks ago. But now the new iPhone 4S is instead creating confusion. And not least here in the Maastricht area of Aberdeen, where I put the voice recognition software to the test. Is it a nice day? Let's see what it says. I don't know what you mean by, is it NAST to says? And so this goes on, and they talk to a bunch of people about bakeries and where the, this is. One of the things it could pick up is where there was Starbucks, um, which is really interesting. And then they have this other, if you go on there and you look up this stuff, there's a guy in Boston with a really strong Boston accent. And so fast forward two years, here's a video of my mom. She finally can use Siri because there's now a workaround. So, um, here she is. Okay, so your Siri works now. Hey, Siri. Is it going to rain today? There's no rain in the forecast for today. Oh, Siri. <laughs> what did they change? They made the voice recognition so much better. When you go on, it says to say, hey, Siri. And you, are you telling me I'm not? No. You're still videoing me. <laughs> <laughs> so she'd be so mortified if she knew I was. Um, but, you know, she's so happy. And in California, we have a big drought. She wakes up every morning. Hey, Siri, is it going to rain today? You know, it's her first question. My dad wants to throw the iPhone out the window. But it's great. And, I mean, you see, like, like these little experiences mean a lot to people. And she, you know, she's already an Apple devotee, but now she's not going anywhere for a long time. So the big challenge here is really selling this internally. Um, how do we get our clients, our companies, and our organizations to spend time and money on experience? You know, how do we hold releases for things that seem little? Um, you know, and part of this is really bringing people into this sort of empathetic way of working. Um, these should look pretty uh, familiar. These are, you know, the steps of, of a process. Discover, concept, test, iterate, launch, iterate. And all these blue pieces we make really collaborative. We design and plan with a very diverse group of people. Um, it's great for us designers to understand what's keeping the product folks up at night, you know, and vice versa. It's great for us to know the headaches of the engineers and, and vice versa. Um, we respect each other more and, and, and there's just a greater understanding for both the work that we're doing and the, you know, what is going to confront our users. And what really happens when you bring people into this is that the idea of their designs become our designs. And what I mean by that is you'll sit in a room selling ideas. Even internally, we sell ideas up the ladder, right? So it's not this is what UX did, you know, when someone from engineering is talking about this is what UX did. This is what we did. This was our solution. This is our design. Everyone is bought in. It makes the whole process a lot easier, and it makes things really, really run nice and smooth. And users are diverse. Your group should be diverse. I don't understand how I can go into a workshop somewhere and it's just dudes. Like, that doesn't make sense to me. You really have to diversify your groups to get a good response and to get an accurate response of what is out there. And, you know, here's the rub with, with quantifying experience. If you're doing a good job, it's possible no one will notice, like with the power company that's always on. Or people only think about web hosting when it goes down, you know, and they have problems and then they get support. Um, and, you know, we have to evidence the work that we do, and it's really important to remind people that you are doing work and you're working for them and they're getting good service. That's why, you know, in a hotel room, they're folding toilet paper to let you know that they've cleaned the room, right? Even though it's pretty obvious, but just to remind you, you know, the room is clean, but, you know, they're reminding you. And we tell people that their servers are running great. You know, there's no downtime. If you have Nest, they send out this great newsletter that I don't know what it means, but it makes me know that my Nest is doing great stuff for me. Um, and part of that Harvard study, one of the most interesting stats that came out of it was they found that a customer who has a positive experience has a 74% chance of remaining a customer for six years. 
and that is massive. If you are in any kind of subscription-based industry, I think that's a great stat to take to your next meeting when you're trying to hold something because the experience sucks. And frankly, unhappy customers are expensive customers. They call, they tweet, they chat, they become annoying. Um, so when we think about crafting experiences, I'm just out of time here, so I'm gonna leave you with, think about consistency and experience, think about the value for effort, think about understanding emotional uh, circumstance, be the squeaky wheel, you know, call out things that aren't really working. And just remember that all the code we're writing, all the UI we're designing, um, you know, that's all for a person. And there's a person on the other side of that screen, the laptop, the desktop, the iPhone, whatever it may be. Um, I'm gonna be around here for a little bit. I will post all the slides online uh, with an appendix that has links to all the stuff that we talked about, all the articles. Uh, you can tweet me at John Setzer and email me, and uh, thank you so much.